Hello everyone, uh, this is the Unisoft Law YouTube show back on air and uh, we have a fantastic guest today. I'm sure many of you know him. I assume most of you are from Toronto, uh, the GTA or Ontario. So a lot of you will know him and I assume most of you are lawyers. Uh, this is Omar Haredai. And I'm pretty sure that I got uh, his name right because he recently posted his name's pronunciation on LinkedIn. And as soon as I saw that, I posted my name's pronunciation on LinkedIn too. I thought, what a great idea. Hello, Omar. Hi, Pulat. Thank you for having me. How are you? I'm doing well today. How are you? I'm pretty good. Look, it's really great to have you. And one of the reasons it's really great to have you is because I've known you for about 11 years. I don't know if you remember, but uh, we met, I think, around 2009 when I was in law school. When you were in law school, we were the same year of law school, but different law schools. And you started a, uh, a huge uh, legal uh, blog, a law student blog called lawiscool.com. And uh, I was one of those depressed, uh, low self-esteem law students. And you invited me to uh, write for your blog. I was so honored and I started writing for it. And then I wrote a lot for that blog. Thank you, Omar. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think we, you're right. We've known each other in many different contexts over the years. And uh, we did a podcast as well on that site. We thought about doing uh, video interviews as well. But I think, you know, given the time that probably would have been a little bit too cutting edge. And uh, quite frankly, as law students, uh, we probably had to do some studying to get through law school effectively. So uh, there was only so much we could do. It's great that you're doing this project and I look forward to your future episodes as well. Yes, yeah, so we already recorded quite a few. And you know what, uh, one of the co-founders of lawyerschool.com was on the show. And you know who I'm talking about, Lawrence Gridden. I saw that. He's a really yes. big shot criminal lawyer now. <laughs> and, and you're a big shot civil litigator. So look how far we've all come. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm very, very far from Lawrence. So you know what? I've always thought about you in two ways. Uh, number one, I've always thought of you as a man of mystery. And number two, I've always thought of you as a man of many talents. Uh, a man of mystery is because you often worked on uh, stealth projects that you didn't want to uh, talk about very much. Um, and, uh, uh, and also because you changed quite a bit, a bit over the years, you evolved, you grew. And I, I'm, always, uh, I'm always curious about personal development and about how people change and how people grow. So that's the mystery part. The second part is a man of many talents. And uh, I know that you worked uh, with uh, several large projects and some names that I associate with you are Ryerson, for example, Ryerson University, right? And uh, I also um, uh, associate uh, all kinds of legal blogging with you. I also associate uh, your project called Fleet Street Law with you which you called a legal incubator. And I think it was the first legal incubator in uh, Toronto, maybe in Canada. I also associate, now I associate uh, the Durham Clinic, legal clinic with you, of which you are the executive director for, uh, and you have been an executive director of, of the clinic for about a year now. So <clears throat> you also worked in legal tech projects. Um, you, uh, you touched many things and many people. And uh, I want to ask you now, Omar, who are you? If you were to, to describe yourself in one sentence, who is Omar? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's that simple. Unfortunately, Pulat, I don't want to be constrained in that way. Uh, and I don't see these as being separate initiatives either. So. Uh, a lot of what we're doing right now at the Durham Community Legal Clinic brings together many of those experiences and many of those uh, projects that I've been involved in over the years, in particular technology. I think this is going to be a crucial juncture for legal aid services and for clinics across Ontario. We are facing pressures from our funder uh, under the guise of what's called modernization. And so 
Uh, our funder is expecting greater accountability. And part of that accountability as it relates to taxpayer dollars is whether or not we can improve our processes, do things better, and perhaps do it with some technology. And so uh, can we actually provide taxpayers better value and better services to the public through technology? I strongly believe that we can. And uh, we have a number of initiatives already underway at the Durham Community Legal Clinic that utilize and employ technology to help facilitate that. Well, two questions, Omar. First of all, who's your funder? So uh, all of the community legal clinics in Ontario, or I should say the 72 community legal clinics in Ontario are funded primarily by Legal Aid Ontario, okay? There are a few other clinics that have different funding that are focused on more specialized areas or, or different subsets of the law, but uh, we are primarily funded by Legal Aid Ontario, which gets its money from two major sources, so the Ministry of Attorney General and then the Law Foundation of Ontario. The Law Foundation of Ontario, as many of us will know, gets their money from the interest on money in lawyers' trust accounts. And from that money, they fund projects like Can Lee. They also fund the uh, Legal Aid Ontario and the community legal clinics as well. So uh, that's all very, very important to keep in mind that we are part of that public interest uh, and public facing uh, aspects of our legal system where we're trying to not just litigate, so we obviously represent clients, but we frequently uh, engage in public legal education and providing legal training and providing resources to the public. Uh, and it's very much part of that same ecosystem of the Law Foundation of Legal Aid Ontario and even Can Lee for that matter. Mm -hmm. Omar, what is uh, the mandate of uh, Durham Community Legal Clinic? So the main focus is to assist the low income individuals in Durham region, which is a very large region, with their legal issues. Now, the best way that we can assist them is not just by looking at their immediate issue. So for example, it's very common, uh, the vast majority of our files are in uh, housing. So people getting evicted is a major, major issue, especially during the pandemic. Uh, and so the question shouldn't just be, okay, so you're being evicted, how do we actually mount a defense or a response? It's also looking at the root causes of that eviction, uh, especially where these individuals are in poverty and saying, are there ways that we can get you some job retraining? Can we find you some additional resources? Are there employment services that can be of assistance? Uh, if you have some substance abuse problems or mental health issues, are there some resources like that that we can help you with as well? And so using this holistic approach towards individuals' legal problems is the way that we really try to address poverty alleviation. And so it's not just legal issues for low-income individuals, it's the socioeconomic issues of individuals who are living in poverty that we are trying to address. So is it fair to say that your clinic is fighting poverty? Certainly, we are one of the very, very important institutions that help alleviate poverty uh, the origins of the clinics go back, or the clinic system go back to the 70s. So there's a very, very long history there. And part of the rationale there, uh, beyond just poverty alleviation, is that we also do law reform um, and, and provide submissions to the government in terms of various legislative changes, because what we do is we give a voice to low-income individuals and a lens, a poverty law lens, to the legal system and the legal issues that we're facing. And so you know, Pulat, we both know, we've, we've heard this concept of access to justice being bandied around now for years. And so uh, chief justices from the Supreme Court of Canada all the way to the Court of Appeal to Superior Court of Justice in Ontario, they all recognize that we have an access to justice crisis. We hear everybody talking about that. The difference is the access to justice crisis for most Canadians is very, very different than it is for those who are living in poverty. In other words, it's not even a crisis. Access to justice doesn't exist. There is no justice in these people's worlds and in their lives. The legal system, and quite frankly, from their perspectives, the system as a whole has operated wholeheartedly and uh, consistently to keep them in poverty, to keep them marginalized, and to keep them from fully participating in society. And so, that is really what we're trying to transform. It's more than uh, just, like I said, the legal issues. Poverty alleviation is about transformation 
of the living circumstances that individuals in poverty are experiencing. Earlier, you said that your funder expects um, some kind of measurable uh, outcomes uh, from uh, your clinic or from similar clinics. Can you please speak to the metrics or uh, form of outcomes that uh, are expected of Durham Community Legal Clinic or similar clinics to yours? So it's probably useful for everybody in the public to be aware of this, but uh, these negotiations are ongoing. Bill 161, which was passed earlier this year by the provincial government, effectively con cancelled the contract between Legal Aid Ontario and every one of the 72 clinics in Ontario as of April 2021. So as of April 2021, we no longer have a funding agreement. We no longer have a contract with LAO. The rationale, don't get too alarmed, the rationale there is that we are going to be in negotiations with our funder as to what a funding agreement looks like. And so those metrics and that type of transparency is still very much up for discussion. So I'm hoping that conversations like the one that we're having here, Pulat, will inform those conversations. It's very important for uh, not just the public, but for the legal industry to be aware that those conversations are happening because uh, we do provide an enormous benefit and enormous function to the legal system as a whole. And so if they're not aware or if they're oblivious uh, as to what's occurring right now in the clinic system, they may not recognize the pressures that we're facing. And, and very briefly, what I'll do is try to illustrate how we benefit, for example, the legal system. We all know some of the challenges that we're facing with self-reps generally, right? And that's part of the access to justice challenge. But when you're dealing with self-reps who are in poverty and may also have some mental health issues and or some substance abuse issues or just issues related to poverty, because those individuals have very complex life experiences. When they are self-representing, it's an entirely different experience. In other words, the non-appearances to courts are significantly higher. The, the literacy level, so legal literacy and financial literacy, is often impaired. The ability to actually negotiate and to abide by an agreement uh, may be compromised. And so having legal representation, which is part of what we do in that process, it usually facilitates and expedites the proceedings. It allows for counsel on the other side of a matter to actually have an individual who can help uh, facilitate a discussion and a negotiated settlement. Uh, it allows, if it's not going to be settled and it's going to be litigated, it allows for the trier fact, it allows for a judge to have coherent and organized legal arguments presented before them. And uh, that's not necessarily, I mean, there's very, very sophisticated self-represented uh, self litigants out there most of them are not in the type of poverty and the type of circumstances that we see our clients in. And so those are the ways that we actually help facilitate access to justice and ultimately benefit the broader legal system as well. I understand that you do a lot of work on behalf of tenants, correct? And Certainly, you said yes. You do a lot of eviction work or anti-eviction work. So uh, I, I assume that you uh, work a lot in the landlord and tenant board or tribunal? Our clinic does, yes. Personally, I don't, but our clinic yes. certainly does. We have quite a bit of volume at the landlord tenant board. Uh, can you tell me uh, uh, approximately what the breakdown is among different kinds of work that you do? So there is a large chunk that is in the LTB. And then what other areas do you guys cover? So we also cover what we call uh, social assistance. So that would include Ontario Works, ODSP, so people who are receiving government assistance, um, CPP overpayments, uh, things like that. We do employment law, we do human rights, we do WSIB, um, and those are all part of the core clinic activities. We also have an access to justice hub, and through that hub, we have a year-long tax clinic, so a free tax clinic to any of the members of our community, and then we also provide additional legal services, for example, in small claims, in POA, and other legal services. And those legal services are beyond LAO. And so this is where we have a clinic plus model. We have LAO funding to, to fund our core services, but we offer some additional services beyond that in the interest of facilitating access to justice, even for those individuals that are above those LAO thresholds because the financial eligibility for LAO is very low. It's in fact below the poverty line in most circumstances. And who, who funds your uh, extracurricular activities? 
So we, we use some creative arrangements for that to happen. And uh, a big part of that is partnerships with other members in the community, other uh, community agencies, quite frankly. So we have uh, John Howard Society, we have the Mental Health Association, we have the Brain Injury Association, we have uh, CDCD. We have a whole bunch of different organizations that actually, outside of the pandemic, provide on-site legal resources, or on-site social resources in the legal context. Uh, and, and there's also a very close partnership with the region of Durham. So we have a good working relationship with them uh, and Durham College. So Durham College is our local community college. They provide paralegal students. Those students do their placements at our clinic and they also provide them legal services under supervision. So uh, it's a pretty complex arrangement for a lot. So there's no simple answer as to how we do this quote unquote extracurricular activities. Uh, but it is very much part of what we're trying to do to transform the community that we're in. Uh, is your clinic a registered charity? Can you raise money from private sources? We can, yes. We are a registered charity. We have been for uh, decades, as far as I know. Um, the clinic has been around for 35 years. It's our 35th anniversary this year and uh, has been a registered charity for much of that time. So when our viewers decide what charity to donate to next, they should very well consider Durham Community Legal Clinic or their local community legal clinic, correct? Certainly, yes. I, not all community legal clinics are registered charities, but quite a few of them are. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're, we're not, certainly not going to say no to that money. And more importantly, we intend to put that money to good work. Uh, we are probably the most efficient use of taxpayer dollars in the uh, system generally. So if we look at provincial funding, uh, every $1 that goes to legal aid typically has about $16 a return for taxpayers because, again, through poverty alleviation, we're, we're actually doing all kinds of things such as getting people to file their taxes and then, for example, they're able to get the Canada Child Benefit Tax, okay? Uh, and then they can spend that money for their rent, for example, or for groceries or for other types of things. And so the yeah. services that we provide really have a, a magnification effect. And so if we're doing that with taxpayers' money, uh, I think that uh, donors as well would, would know that we're able to use that money effectively as well uh, along the same lines for similar purposes. I think every lawyer who went to court and certainly every judge appreciates, should appreciate your work because most of them dealt with self-represented <laughs> litigants and they certainly know how harmful uh, this whole idea of self-representation is to the litigants themselves and to the system and how happy every participant of the proceeding usually is when uh, the person is actually represented because things move along faster and there is simply less injustice. We certainly have a lot of support throughout the legal community. Uh, but in particular, the judiciary, right, as, as you pointed out, the, the difference here is that the judiciary cannot be involved in social and political issues. And so when it comes to these broader discussions that we're all having about funding of community legal clinics, members of the judiciary are not involved in that. What might be worth remembering is that it wasn't that long ago, so it was a, a couple decades ago, when the Law Society of Ontario actually used to fund Legal Aid Ontario or fund the legal aid services in the province. So the history, our history, prior to this being carved out by Legal Aid Ontario and having a separate agency, was that the, the bar, so the, the members of the legal community themselves, took direct responsibility for ensuring that these types of services were being provided. Now, granted, it was a smaller society that, at that time, a simpler society, perhaps, and there was a, a lot less members of the legal community, so maybe a little bit easier to organize in that respect. But if you look at our history and our traditions um, for the past 50 years, at least in, in Ontario, there has always been a sense of responsibility for ensuring that this type of system is maintained. Uh, with the cuts that we've seen last year uh, from the provincial government, many of those services have been compromised. We've all had to cut back on some of our services. And so I think it is, uh, it's an opportunity for many of us to do what we're doing here in this conversation full lot which is to remind the legal community of the importance of the services that we provide, uh, not just as, as we sort of alluded to in terms of poverty alleviation, but also to the integrity of the justice system as a whole. Mm -hmm. 
Now, you talked uh, earlier about the social and political activism that your clinic engages in, and I assume other clinics engage in. And you talked about uh, poverty alleviation as one of the goals of your clinic. And when you talked about poverty, you engaged the historical context a bit, and you said that the system was designed to keep these people in poverty or to keep these people from par participating. And uh, my question to you is, first of all, why was the system designed that way in your view and what you do to change the system? So uh, let me clarify here. I, I think what I said was that the perception of our many of our clients is that the system was designed in that way. Uh, I, I think to a certain extent, there, there are some inequities in our system. We know that the legal system generally favors property holders over people who are not property holders. That's uh, very much entrenched in terms of historical uh, aspects of the law. The common law itself was very much uh, rights oriented towards those who had power. It was the courts of equity that really looked at those exceptions and created the softness, if you will, of the common law that looked at things like duress or undue influence and power imbalances. And ultimately, when we're looking at poverty, that's what we're talking about here is power imbalances. And so it's not that the law cannot address aspects of power imbalances or poverty within the legal system. It's that there are so many aspects of it that were not structured in a way to do so. Uh, in terms of broader society at large, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, less so than perhaps other capitalistic societies. I'm not anti-capitalistic. Uh, but, but less so than other capitalistic societies, we do have a social welfare system. We do have a social safety net. And for many of our clients, that social safety net hasn't operated effectively for a number of different reasons. Some of it may just be that they don't know those resources exist. And so a big part of what we do is helping to facilitate those uh, transfers and those uh, introductions to ensure that they actually access services that historically they haven't been able to. But part of it is also distrust, right? So if you, you see the society that you're, you're, you've grown up around as being always against you, always shutting you out, not lending a sympathetic ear, then you're much less likely to consider that a partner, a community partner like a community legal clinic is going to also assist you given the history of your experiences. What's different with what they do with us is that they come to us with a legal problem. So uh, I'll use a different situation, right? So let's say someone had a job. It wasn't a very well-paying job. Uh, they were being harassed on their job and, and maybe being paid less than minimum wage illegally. And they come to us for help. Uh, because they're in dire circumstances and situations. So this is before they're getting evicted, because that's what's going to happen down the road, of course. Okay, This is before all the other problems in their life that are going to emerge uh, start to emerge. And we can jump in at that point in time and have conversations with them because of the solicitor-client relationship. In other words, let me put this differently. They may not be willing to talk to a social worker. They may not be willing to talk to the uh, local uh, aid worker. They may not be willing to speak to government agents or officials, okay, that, that might be operating in Service Ontario, Service Canada, to explore what services or benefits might be available because of the inherent distrust that they have accumulated over their lifetime. When they come to us with a legal problem, those boundaries and those barriers have to fall. I'm not saying it happens in every case, but in order for them to have effective legal representation or to obtain effective legal services, they need to recognize that everything that they share with us is confidential, first of all, is not going to be shared with anybody else. And then that allows them to start talking. And once they start talking, we begin to understand the fulsome nature of many of their circumstances and complexities and issues that they're facing. And then start to develop a relationship. And it's with that relationship that we can then encourage them to access other resources. That doesn't happen outside of the solicitor-client relationship. Uh, and and, and I'll, I'll use a little bit of an analogy here for you, Pulat, uh, which is going to be the, the Insight case. So PHS case that went up to the Supreme Court of Canada uh, a few years back. And if you recall, the federal government was very much opposed to having safe injection sites because they felt that that circumvented the criminal law jurisdiction, whereas the provincial government was saying, no, this is a health and safety issue. And it's one of my favorite uh, cases to use to help illustrate this because 
you know, nobody wants to feel as if we're encouraging or promoting the use of intravenous drug use recreationally and, and all of the, the whole host of social and, quite frankly, economic and legal issues that, that typically fall uh, or flow from that, okay? Um, but what, what the evidence was from the community agencies that were doing these safe injection sites was very different. And it was a similar narrative of what I've described to you here about the facilitation of a trusting relationship that allowed them to take these intravenous drug users and allow them to get help, get the counseling and get the drug uh, use problems under control and to ultimately get them to be more productive members of society. What that case also though illustrated was that about 75%, I think that's the numbers that I'm recalling, of all of those intravenous drug users were the victims of sexual abuse, okay? And quite often the victims of sexual abuse during childhood, all right? Uh, and I say this because it helps contextualize individuals who are in different difficult life circumstances. It's very easy to disregard or brush off and discount individuals who are not just intravenous drug users, but people who are homeless or who didn't graduate high school or who really haven't accomplished the types of things that you and I have in terms of our lives, in terms of getting university education and not just one degree, but multiple degrees and, and ultimately getting a law degree. So for many of us in the legal profession, it can be challenging to relate to individuals who have continued to live all the way into their adulthood in circumstances where it doesn't look like they've accomplished or achieved much. But once you start peeling back those layers, and once you begin to understand that at the root cause of many of these people's lives are some very, very deep and horrific traumas, okay, including sexual abuse, it's, it's not uncommon, um, and, and starting quite often in the home, right? So very close family members who may have initiated this, we begin to, I hope, have a little more compassion and sympathy for the circumstances which people have found their lives, lives in. It's not that they chose to, to go a certain path and to end up in the circumstances that they were in, it's that when they were quite often in very vulnerable circumstances and situations in their life, other individuals took advantage of them. And those other, other individuals may still continue to take advantage of them. So we, we've seen, for example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, that there are tenants who have had landlords approach them and say, well, you know, I understand that you lost your job, you can't pay rent, and that's a very common situation that we're seeing right now. And, and it's not to say we don't sympathize with landlords in regards to their financial situations, but there are some, not a lot, uh, unscrupulous landlords who are then saying, well, why don't we find another way for you to make rent? Why don't we use some creative methods to make rent? In other words, trying to solicit sexual favors. Okay, so this is what we're really talking about here, is the inherent power imbalances that emerge from people who are in the context of poverty, which allow for other individuals to take advantage of them. And that's what we're trying to do here. I mean, in addition to all the other stuff that we're talking about here, that is the importance of that safety net. And what I can say, Pulat, is that the poverty in Ontario has increased. It hasn't decreased. And the amount of funding that we've seen for community legal clinics has not increased commensurate to those needs that we have seen in the community. So we are only making a very, very small dent in terms of what we are uh, able to do or what we perhaps should be doing in the community, but that need is very, very apparent. And perhaps, I mean, this is worth highlighting because of the pandemic, that in the after effects of the pandemic, the economic recession and perhaps even the depression that we face, the need for enhanced funding, so in other words, even more support for legal aid and for community legal clinics has never been more apparent than this time in our entire lifetimes. We have never seen a pandemic like this in our life. And more importantly, the economic impacts from this pandemic are going to be something that uh, Western societies have never seen. So the last pandemic that we've seen that is perhaps comparable to this would have been the, the influenza pandemic about a century ago. The financial and the economic circumstances of those times are very, very different than in 2020. And so we are going to expect some very complex and perhaps even long-term financial uh, repercussions from this pandemic. And that's going to mean that we need to really look at and uh, ensure that that social safety net that I was describing and I was talking about is, is there firmly in place and in fact is firmly supported by all levels of government and by members of the legal community.
Yes, Omar, this certainly makes a lot of sense. And uh, I've been giving some thought during this emergency that we have in the world right now to how people without the safety net or without the education or people in dire circumstances are coping. And you just uh, brought it back to uh, the fore for me. And I must admit, I, 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 it's not really um, uh, the number one uh, item on my agenda when I, when I think about different issues every day, but I think people definitely should pay more attention to that both out of compassion and because of self-interest. And uh, I will check here with you to see if my words make sense to you, but the more poverty we have, the more everyone spends on, at least in countries like Canada, on healthcare, uh, the more we have to spend on, uh, on the criminal justice system. And uh, uh, the, uh, the more crime we have, so in this respect, I'm, I'm really curious if you do any criminal uh, work in your clinic. We don't. So the legal aid system, it essentially carves out uh, family law and criminal law and uh, uses a certificate model to provide those services. Okay. Mm -hmm. but, I, but you're right. You're 100% correct that a lot of what we do is to try to ensure that people have jobs, have resources, have the funding that they need in other ways so that we can actually avoid being in the circumstances and situations of criminality. I think it's, it's very easy to sort of think that people who are criminals made a choice and wanted to be criminals, et cetera. It, it's not that. The, the facts don't bear that out. It's usually desperation. It's not greed, okay? Uh, for the vast majority of people. There are individuals, of course, who resort to criminality for greed, but, but really it's desperation in most circumstances that push people in those directions. The other area that you touched on, family law, is also an area we don't provide legal services on per se, but we talked about the Access to Justice Hub, and so we do have uh, some family law triage that we do through our Access to Justice Hub, because again, most people's family law issues, uh, which often does result in poverty, quite frankly, okay, um, they are social in nature. The legal components of a family law dispute is probably about 10%, 90% of it is financial and social uh, issues that we can try to address through the various hub partners that we have uh, that provide services, again, for free. Um, and so, so again, what we see is often with our clients is that it's one of two things. They are either in a cycle of poverty, so it's intergenerational poverty. Uh, and in that intergenerational poverty, there is a breakdown in the family. So there's a family breakdown and that's passed on to a generation, that's passed on to a generation, and it's a continuous process. Or the other type of circumstance or situation that we often see is, is not that, so it's not necessarily um, that type of situation, but some big trauma or impact had affected uh, a family or an individual, and then the family breakdown still occurs. And so many of the clients that we see are also the result of a family breakdown. So whereas they may have had uh, two incomes for a household previously, and maybe it was two minimum wage incomes, but it at least was two incomes. When you then have to split the household uh, with, with, with one income and are still having to then potentially have dependents and then maybe have all of the, the financial and economic and social and psychological stress of the family law proceedings, which uh, without representation can take an enormous toll, uh, we see individuals whose lives really do end up becoming in crisis. And so that is also part of what we're trying to uh, address in, in, our, in our clinic and our hub. You talked about uh, the pandemic, and I can't help thinking about all this new funding that is coming from the federal government and from the provincial government as well, uh, you know, on different fronts, from straightforward things that are very similar to basic income to uh, targeted, dedicated uh, programs to uh, support certain specific projects. Have you looked into obtaining any funding from the federal government uh, under this emergency regime? So it's, it's interesting because I, I mentioned uh, previously about Law Foundation of Ontario being one of our funders indirectly uh, through LAO. And because of the pandemic, 
uh, the amount of money that are in lawyers' trust accounts is less, obviously. There's less legal transactions occurring. And so there's an estimated $70 million deficit for Legal Aid Ontario because of those Law Foundation of Ontario uh, contributions. And so, yes, we're having conversations, and this is all pandemic related. We're having conversations with the provincial and the federal government to see what can be done in this context, but it does demonstrate and illustrate how there are many ripple effects and unintended uh, consequences and effects that are gonna come from this pandemic. So um, the federal government does contribute towards legal aid, it does, uh, not as much as it has historically. I think that's a point of contention for the provinces and uh, we can only hope that they do more. Um, and in this pandemic, there are some initiatives currently underway to try to get them to provide some of that emergency funding during the pandemic to ensure continuity. Because right now we're dealing with a crisis. We're dealing with a crisis of funding uh, where the clinics may not exist in the form that we are right now unless there is immediate action taken by uh, the federal and provincial governments. When you talked about um, all the areas of work that you cover uh, in your clinic, it struck me that most of it is in tribunals. Yes. Uh, it's not in the Superior Court. <clears throat> it's not in the federal court. It's in the tribunals. And of course, one can argue that tribunals themselves were created as an effort to alleviate poverty or at least to address this uh, power imbalance. Uh, because our traditional courts, of course, uh, require uh, huge investments in legal fees to, uh, to move along the system. And in the tribunals, they simplified the rules of procedure and uh, they just made everything uh, different. They also created statutory presumptions, essentially that altered contracts or that made or voided contracts that were considered un uh, unconscionable by public policy. So tribunals are, uh, have been this positive uh, effort over many years now uh, to address poverty and other related issues. And uh, your, most of your work is in, in the tribunal. So what do you think about this theory that Canada should have a universal legal aid system similar to its universal public health system, but just in the tribunals, uh, not in the superior court, maybe not even in small claims court, because you know, having worked in small claims court, I mean, I would have some questions about such program applying to there. But tribunals, which are usually specialized, what do you think about that idea? To a certain extent, we already do this, right? So we actually provide, for example, tenant duty council services that are free on site with uh, the Residential Tenancies Act, so the Landlord Tenant Board. Uh, and that, so people walk in, they haven't retained us as a clinic, um, they see somebody there, they don't know that that person is employed by the clinic, quite frankly. They just know that somebody is there to help them. So we do that in a limited capacity already. Um, I think, you know, to more and more, to, to address your question more broadly, if you go to the Human Rights Tribunal, for example, and I think this is where you start to see those issues more pronounced, um, where the vast majority of those cases emerge in the employment context, <clears throat> every single one of those employers is represented right? And I would say the vast majority, perhaps 90% of the uh, employees are not represented at all. And so that becomes a problem. That's, that's an inherent problem within the tribunals. I think your proposal would help expedite proceedings at tribunals. It would make them more effective. Uh, it would be cost effective to do it. I think it would actually cost the legal system less to fund clinics to expand our programs so that we provide free representation to all Ontarians, that would be amazing, okay, before a tribunal, uh, than it would be to actually still try to have all of these matters heard by people who are effectively self-representing themselves before those same tribunals. Uh, I, I think those questions though, um, and those discussions need to come from the legal community. So I, we have a, a, an attorney general right now in Ontario who is very supportive of the community legal clinics. Uh, which is a good thing, and he is receptive to ideas. And so if the legal community, that's where it has to come from, not from the clinics themselves, we don't have that type of agency or power, was to say, you know what, this makes sense. We just have to do it, 
and to make the economic argument about why it would work better, uh, I, I can actually see that potentially having some traction in Ontario. All right. Well, on this note, uh, I, I hope optimistic note, uh, I would like to wrap our interview up. You certainly opened my eyes to uh, a lot of the issues related to poverty and law. I haven't taken uh, law and poverty in law school, and maybe I should have, but you just provided me with a 45 minute summary. That's really useful. And on behalf of our viewers, thank you so much, Omar. It's been a great pleasure as always. Thank you, Pulat. It was a pleasure. Take care. Take care.